Alhamdulillah, all praises for Allah. And may peace and blessings be upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First thing I want to say, I'm impressed, mashaAllah, alhamdulillah, Allahumma barak. This masjid looks beautiful. It's my first time here. I parked up, I walked in, the glass, the structure, this community, you guys have done a great job. It looks very, very beautiful. We need something like this in London, definitely. I hope you guys are taking care of it and doing it justice by visiting it regular. You know, visiting it regular and spending much time here. Alhamdulillah, it's a pleasure and an honor to be invited here to spend this time with you while I'm here in Manchester. Um, it's been a while, if I'm honest, since I sat and I shared my story. It's been so many years since that day that I converted to Islam, like I was guided. An amazing thing. Like sometimes I went to a lecture once and I was listening and the Imam was speaking and he had this passion in his voice and he's looking at the audience of Muslims and he said, imagine if we would, didn't have this religion. Imagine if we was not Muslims. How would our lives be if we wasn't blessed with the religion of Islam? Just imagine that brothers and sisters and as he said it, you could see everyone reflecting and imagining what their life will be like without this faith. Because we go through stages in our life where we are low. Things are going to bring you down in this world. This is the dunya. It's not created to be perfect. So we're going to go through phases where we feel super low. Where we go through hardship. Where we go through pain, suffering, struggle. And imagine in those times we can all take out our mat. Make wudu, ablution, and go and talk to our Lord. Ask for ease, ask for guidance, ask for protection, ask for mercy. But imagine if we didn't have this faith, this religion. What would our lives be like? So as he said that, I sat there and I said, I don't even need to imagine. I know exactly what life was like without this faith. So alhamdulillah, when we say these things, you know sometimes with faith, with religion... We learn these terminologies and sometimes they just roll off our tongue. Alhamdulillah. But we have to be the people that ponder upon these words. We don't just say it like a quick ritual. It's actually a spiritual thing. Think about what we're saying. Alhamdulillah. All praises for Allah. And honestly, when I sit here and I say Alhamdulillah, it's because of all of that. This journey from the streets to Islam, I picture my life before. I picture everything I went through. I picture how it could have been. And I picture where I am now. And I honestly sit here and I say, wow. Alhamdulillah. All praise really is to Allah. You know, we seek his help. We seek his forgiveness. We seek his guidance, his mercy. Whoever Allah guides, nobody can misguide. And who Allah misguides, nobody can guide. And I bear witness there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah who is one, who has no partners. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and messenger. Alhamdulillah. So when we don't have this religion, we don't have this guidance, what do we have? What do people turn to? When they're going through hardship or they're going through loss or they're going through sorrow or desperate times and they're sad, what do they do? I know what it's like not to be a Muslim. I come to talk about my journey. And my journey begins as a child. And as a child, I was raised with my mum. She's Jamaican. And I remember my mum was going through hardship. My mum's actually an orphan. So my mum was given away when she's like two years old by her mum. She was given to the neighbor. You're going to have to take care of her because her mom had the opportunity to go to England. So she left my mom with the neighbor and she didn't know her dad. So imagine my mom's an orphan. She's raised by this neighbor. And my mom didn't know her parents. So already that's a hardship. You got no mom or dad. You're surrounded by people with parents. So you're sad. Now my mom 
when she reached a teenager, she badly wanted to know who her parents were. So you know sometimes we're hit with a hardship and we always have these questions, why me, why me, why am I going through this? Well, the truth is every single one of us are going through some sort of test or some sort of hardship. This was the hardship my mum was going through. She has no parents, no mum, no dad, which means she got no grandparents, which means she got no cousins, no, no, no brothers and sisters, no aunties, no uncles, nothing. So this is what's bringing her down. And when she hits her teens, she has an opportunity to come to the UK. So when mum got the opportunity to come to the UK, she's happy, she's excited. She wants to go because why? My mum's there, I might be able to meet my mum. So my mum flies to the UK, but her fairy tale doesn't end up being the way she wanted it to be. So she ends up with her best friend from Jamaica who had an apart a flat in London, Brixton, South London, and she sleeps on her sofa. And then time passes, let me not go into my mum's journey too much, but time passes and she has children, me and my sister. And she's living in a council flat in South London. So my mum living in this council flat in South London, she doesn't have nothing in the UK. My dad has left her, so she's broke. So I'm just trying to set up the picture, paint it for you. She's broke, she's got no family, and she's got two children that she has to look after. It's not easy, it's a struggle. Like I asked, how old are you with the, with the nice afro? 10 years old. So imagine, she's, I was about 10, she's looking after these two kids. Like this kid next door, he's having fun. <laughs> that must be a like tiggling game or something going on over there. But she's trying to look after these two children and it's difficult. She's struggling. So because she's struggling so much, she becomes depressed and stressed. But she doesn't have this religion of Islam. So when she's depressed and stressed, what does she do? She starts turning to drink. They turn to drugs. Because these type of things are like pain numbers. They say it numbs the pain because it takes you out of your, your, your the mental state. So my mum starts drinking a lot. Every day, every day, every day drinking. Because when you drink, it's like you don't have to think about your situation too much. So this is the kind of household I grew up in when I was a child. My mum is basically an alcoholic, addicted to alcohol. And that affects your character. So she's very aggressive. Always shouting, always screaming when she's drunk. But when she's not drunk, she's super calm. Very, very calm, always wants to sleep. Now, I start talking about my mum like this, but I'll end up talking about her in a different way. Love her to death. But this was her journey. Now, I had to watch this. But one thing I will say is my mum taught me something from very young about faith and religion and lessons in life. Because although she had all these hardship and she had all these struggles, there was one thing my mum used to say, because if you, if you don't, can't turn to the drink, there's another thing. If you ain't got nothing, you turn to God. Because that's, there's, that's the only person that can help you, you think. So you know the poor people, like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he loved the poor people, the miskeen. He said, bury me with the miskeen, raise me with the miskeen. Because when you're poor and you don't have much, you turn to God more. Like we see the people who are suffering around the world. It seems like they have so much iman. Because who else have you got to turn to? So my mum used to always say, all we have is God. That's the only person who can help us. So remember, we're not Muslims, but my mom used to say, all we have is God. The only person who can help us is God. So you better pray to God. You better pray to God. Even when I was bad and I used to get in trouble, my mom used to send me to my room and my punishment was, go and learn the, the Lord's Prayer. Go and memorize it. But this is the Lord's Prayer in Christianity. So I'd be in my room and I weren't allowed to leave till I knew it by heart. And then another time I got punished, she said, go in your room and memorize the books of the Bible in order. So I have to go to my room and memorize the books of the Bible and say, you're not allowed to leave your room till you know it by heart. To this day, I still remember that. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. Like, I had to memorize it and she'll test me. Or I can't, that was my punishment. So it was always something to do with God. 
because that's all that could help us. And another thing, I'll go into it, that she taught me was about character. So remember, we're broke, we're poor, we're struggling, we ain't got no money. We're so poor, but my mum had this certain character, like we're so poor that anything I asked for, she'd always say no. So I see this young man's got some sweets right there. As a kid, we love sweets. So anytime I go in the shop with my mum, she might be going to get a milk. I say, mum, I'll pick up the sweets. You don't know what it's like. Mum, can we get this? She just look at me. No, we can't have it. So I'm upset. Anytime we go out, I'll pass a trainer shop. Oh, mum, can I get a new trainers? No, you can't have it. So I'll be upset. So I'm always angry and I'm always upset as a child. And my mum used to say, what are you going to do? Eat the trainers for dinner. We can't even afford money to buy, new, to buy dinner. For, I can't even afford to send you to school tomorrow and you're asking for new trainers. So we were so poor that sometimes my mum used to send me to the shop and I live on an estate, like a council estate. And when she said, used to send me to the shop, she used to send me with no money. She used to just write down things on a piece of paper. Get this, milk, rice, Da, 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 da. And then she used to take the paper and she'd write on the back, give my, my son these things and I'll pay you on the 18th of the month when I get paid. So I used to walk to the shop with this note. And I'd go in the shop and I'd pick up all this stuff. I'd go to the counter and i say to the mum, man, yeah, my, um, my mum sent me to get this stuff. And he's looking at me for the money. I said, oh, he said to give you, she said to give you this. He read the note. They say, tell your mum next time I'm not doing this. It's the last time, because we keep doing it. So I get angry as a kid. I was about your age, 10 years old. I was looking at him. I just take the stuff and I walk back home. But I'm angry and I'm upset. Why? Why don't we have money? Why can't I have new trainers? And as I'm walking home through my estate and I'm seeing some of my friends that I play football with and all these things, I'm looking down and I'm angry. And when I look down at my trainers, my trainers are talking. It's like they're flapping at the front because, you know, when the, the soles rip from the front. <laughs> so people used to say to me, yo, what are you saying, Ashley? I say, huh? And they go, no, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to your trainers. Your trainers are talking. <laughs> that was a cuss. It's because of the flap. So I'll be angry. And sometimes we look at the children and we say, this boy's got behavior problems. He seems too angry in school. But that anger comes from somewhere. I did have these problems, but maybe this anger comes from things I'm going through at home. So I go home and I'm upset, but we never had nothing. Sometimes our electricity used to cut out and we couldn't switch it back on, so we'd have no lights. My Nintendo cut off, I can't play it, there's no electricity. It's cold, there's no gas. Mum, can we top up the electric? She says we can't, we have to wait till Thursday because she got no money. So these are the type of things I'm going through. We have to wait till Thursday. We're in the darkness. Yeah, go and light some candles. So this is how it was for me as a child. But she always used to say, we better just pray to God because I don't know where I'm going to find money from. We better pray to God. So she installed this thing about God in me. But she'd drink because she's struggling. She can't take it. So I'm a child that's observing all this and taking it in. These are the early stages of my life. Now, what I was saying is something my mum taught me in these early stages. There was a man on my estate. We used to call him Mad Glenn. Yeah? Now, Mad Glenn, I don't know if any of you knew someone like this growing up, but you know, like, even I saw someone like this when I was driving there. He stopped at the track, comes up to you at the traffic lights with a cup and asks you for stuff. Mad Glenn used to walk through our estate. He's that type of man. He seems homeless. His clothes are really messed up. And he had mental issues. So when he always like had saliva dripping from his mouth. He used to slur when he spoke and he smelled really bad. Like he never had a bath for like four or five months. So when, when Glenn used to come through the area, as kids, we used to all say, ah, Mad Glenn's coming, Mad Glenn's coming. We were scared of him. So we used to all run away. But my mum, for some reason, used to always invite Mad Glenn in the house. Ah, oh, Glenn, do you want to come in? Glenn, you smell bad, man. Do you want to have a bath? Go, let me get you a towel. Go and have a bath. Go and, have you eaten today, Glenn? Let me get you some food. Dish out food. For, so I used to think, why is my mum keep inviting Mad Glenn in our house? It used to annoy me so much because when I'm playing with my friends, they'd laugh at me and they'll be like, <laughs> what, is Mad Glenn going in your house? What, is that your stepdad? Is that Mad Glenn your mum's boyfriend? And I'll be like, no, no, and I'll be angry. So anyway, when Mad Glenn used to come, I would always know when he was around because I'll come home from school. As soon as I walk through the door, 
Mad Glenn's here. I can smell him. <laughs> so I go in my living room, I see Mad Glenn, and my mum's giving him food. And then when he's leaving, he'd be like, okay, I'm going now, Andrea. Um, do you have, like, one pound, please? And he'd always ask her for money. Remember, we didn't have nothing. But do you know what? My mum used to say, do you know what? Let me have a look. And she'd look through the drawers, look down the side of the sofa, and she might find 70p, and she'd take this. And she'd always, she'd always try and give him something. But we didn't have anything. And then one time he was like, come around and he was begging my mum for five pounds. My mum ain't got money for electric, nothing. And, he's, and my mum, I remember she had about a tenner. And she's giving him five pounds. I'm thinking, but we need that. She says, look, Glenn, this is all I got, ten pounds. Take five pounds of it. That's all I got. I ain't got nothing else. I've got to try and feed the kids. So anyway, one day we're in the house. My mum's drunk. She's been drinking. So she's shouting a lot. She's angry. She's banging the cupboard, swearing, crazy. And she's moving. She's saying things that she'll probably regret, she says. Ah, oh, threatening suicide. I can't live like this anymore. We're just going to have to die and go back to God. I'm going to kill us all. As a kid, I'm scared. Why is my mom saying these things? What do you mean you're going to kill us all? But sometimes you can get so low in life that you don't see no other option and you think that just killing yourself is the best way to escape this pain. So my mom used to say this, and I'm listening to this at 10 years old. I'm just going to kill us all. We can just go back to God because I can't live like this. Bam. I don't know how we're going to survive. Bam. We ain't got no money to, I ain't got no money to give you to go to school tomorrow. Bang. Slamming cupboards. And I'm just there. And I'm just thinking. She said, yeah, you better just pray to God. The electricity is cut out. You better just pray to God. And hope that he sends some money to us. Because I don't know how we're going to live. I don't know how we're going to live. So I'm crying. And I start praying. I'm praying. I'm saying, please God, please God, help my mum. Please God, just help my mum. Please, please, please. Help her, help her, help her. Send us some money, please. And then as she's banging and she's swearing, the door knocks. So every time our door used to knock, we wasn't allowed to go and answer the door straight away. Because it might be someone my mum owed money to. So I always used to have to go to the kitchen window and look who it is. And tell my mum. So she said, go and see who it is. So I go to the kitchen window. I'm looking. It's Mad Glenn. So I said, mum, it's Mad Glenn. She's like, ah. She goes to the door. She opens it. She says, Glenn, I haven't got time today. Can't you see? I've got no electricity in the house. I can't even feed my children. I've got nothing to give you. And she's going to shut the door. But then as she goes to shut the door, he says, wait, wait, wait. Andrea, wait. I come to see you because look. And he takes out this envelope thing. He goes, look, they gave me money. They gave me money. I got 80 pounds from the government. You know you always help me. I come to give you 20 pounds. I owe it to you. And I'm just standing behind my mum and I can see them having this interaction. And I'm thinking to myself, wow. My mum took the 20 pounds and said, oh, thanks, Glenn. Oh, imagine that. And we needed this. And I'm saying, I just prayed. I just prayed and said, God, help my mum and send her some money. And then the door knocks and he came. And he gave her this 20 pound. And my mum was happy. So I remember, I learned a major lesson that day. And I'm a young kid like your age. I said, you know what? I, will add this, I built a connection with my Lord. Like, I will never not pray. I will never not speak. He's the only one that can help us. And also I learned now when I look back, look how my mum was giving when she didn't even have. And she was giving to someone that can't even help her. This is what we'd believe. The local homeless man. But when we was in a time of need, it was that same man that came back and helped us. So I learned something, can always have faith. So for the rest of my life, as a child, I carried that with me. So I was going to school, and even though I was getting up to bad things, and I wasn't a Muslim, I always used to pray to God. Because in every situation and circumstance, I used to always think, God's the only one that can help me. I never forgot that. And there was another thing. I never used, I always used to try and help people if I could. 
Because I never saw it as, and this is what I learned before I was a Muslim. I never saw it as, okay, I'm losing if I help them. I saw it as if I help these people, God's going to help me. Because my mum used to help Mad Glenn, and then God took care of her when we prayed. Do you understand? So I had this when I was even in secondary school. And I went through life. But you know what it's like. I become a teenager. And I started getting attracted to different things. When I was a child, all I wanted was a new pair of trainers and sweets from the shop. Now I'm a teenager. Things have changed. I want more than trainers. I want the things that glitter. I'm seeing this world. I want the cars. I want so much more. I'm now getting caught up in so much more. You know, there was a time where I would have been happy if I just got a new pair of Adidas. And my mum got a job. And I remember when my mum got a job, things started to change now. I'm in like year eight, year nine. And she's like, I got a job, I got a job. And she's excited. They're going to pay me £800 a month. So I'm happy. And it was her first paycheck was going to be on the 18th of the month. And I remember when the 18th of the month come, I came home from secondary school. And my mum says, go to your room. I got you a gift. So I'm excited. She's thinking, I remember the times when I couldn't buy you anything. Now I can't. So I go to my room and I remember seeing this box, a sports bag. And I was like, wow, in a, a box in a sports bag and another, another sports bag. So I opened it, it's like a box of trainers. And you know the, um, like what you're wearing, the Adidas free stripes? I opened it, there's some trainers called sh like shell toes, and they've got the free stripes on the side. I took them out, I'm happy, I'm excited. I look at them, I'm like, yo, one, two, three, four, hold on a second. Adidas has got three stripes, not four. And then I read the tongue, and I'm like, Aribas. So I said, Mom, this ain't Adidas. Where did you get it from? She said, I never told you it was Adidas. I don't know what it is. I got it from the market near my work. I said, the market? Mom, it's fake. It's fake. It's not real Adidas. This is fake. This is Aribas. My mom said, what do you mean it's fake? How can it be fake trainers? It's real. Pull it on and wear it. It's a real trainer. I said, no, it's meant to be Adidas. My mom's just a fresh Jamaican. She's just like, listen. And I'm like, ah, oh, I don't want to wear this, it's fake. Then I'm upset and I open the other bag. I don't know why I'm opening the other bag with a bit of hope, but I'm hoping this is something good. But it's the same shop, so it's probably the same brand. I take it out, I look at it, damn, one, two, three, four, Aribas. I've got the full tracksuit. So now I've got Aribas tracksuit and Aribas trainers. So I'm upset because when you get older now, you care about these things. When we're young, we didn't care about the brands and the name. But now we care about the other people's opinion. We got our ego. It starts to grow inside us. Pride starts to grow inside us. So now I'm like, I can't wear this. It's Aribas. I'm not wearing it. It's fake. My mom says, you better wear it. She's thinking, how ungrateful did I raise this boy? She comes from Jamaica where she had nothing because she walked around barefoot. And now I bought a boy a pair of trainers and a tracks that he's telling me it's fake. He's not wearing it. She said, put it on now and go outside. I'm saying, please, no. Put it on. So I'm crying. I'm put on the Aribas tracksuit and the Aribas trainers. I said, go outside. About you're not wearing it. Go, you're wearing it every day. So I had to go outside in my Aribas tracksuit and trainers. I'm Aribas out. And my friends are out there playing football. That's all we do. 66 World Cup. So I think, you know what? Good thing about football is you're running around a lot. Maybe if I just keep moving, you ain't going to be able to tell if it's three or four because you can't see if I'm holding three fingers or four fingers up when I move. So I'm just running around and I don't want to stop moving in my Aribas until Nathan picks up the ball. This is the boy on my estate he used to be the goalkeeper. And he says, hold on a second. Stop moving a sec. What's that? Aribas? Hey, I know the Adidas. We're not Aribas. Everyone starts laughing. Now, the thing is, as children, this is how we have enjoyment, by putting each other down. That's the fun in it. But you don't know what that's triggering inside someone. So as a young boy wearing Aribas and everyone's laughing, ha, 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 ha. And they're my friends. They're actually my friends, but this is what we do. We don't have role models. We don't learn about companionship. We didn't know about this religion. I wasn't born with this faith. So we weren't going to Arabic school on a Saturday. We weren't learning about the Sahabas, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and learning about their characteristics and their manners 
and how they love for each other, what they would love for themselves, how they would share. We didn't learn that they also went through times of hardship and struggle and not having money to eat. How Abu Huraira tied a rock to his stomach when he was so hungry. We didn't learn these stories. We didn't learn about the kindness of Abu Bakr Siddiq and how he was. We didn't learn about these people. So us as friends, we thought it was fun to cuss each other and laugh at each other. And we didn't share. If one man went to the shop and bought some food and you say, oh, them wings look nice. Well, let me get one. You'd be like, I coughed on it, bro. <laughs> it's my dinner. We don't want to share. It's mine. So this is the type of friendship group we're grown in. So it makes you upset. Why am I wearing Arabas? Why are they laughing at me? And what do you think that does to the young boy? Obviously, I can see there's people in this world who have nice things. I also want to live like them. Them days, we didn't even have social media. It's worse for our kids today. They're exposed to so much. They can see so much. They can see these young rappers. We could tell them in the homes, don't watch this, don't do that, don't do this. They're going to see it. They're going to see how these young people are living. They're going to see the type of clothes they're wearing. They're going to see the kind of lives they're living. And do you know what they're going to do when they're young? They're going to look at it and they're going to envy it. I'm going to say, I want that. I need that. For me, I used, we used to have music videos on MTV. That's what I used to sit in my room and watch. That was my escape. So I sit in my room, I used to watch MTV or a channel called The Box. And it would be music video after music video. And this was my escape. Because I'd be sitting there watching and there was a rapper I used to love. And when his video came on, I remember he's on a yacht, a big boat, and the women are walking around with no clothes on, just like swimsuits. And the wind's blowing his nice shirt with a big Cuban link chain and the Versace glasses and he's smoking a cigar. And he looks so cool through a young man's eyes. He looks so cool. Look at how the wind's blowing his shirt. Look at how he's moving. He's rapping like, yo, yo, I'm big pin pin. Yo, yo, it's just a jigger man, pimp C and we got the, and I'm just looking at him going, yo, yo, I'll even open my pajama shirt. So my shirt looks like his. I roll up my bus pass and pull it in my mouth. This is the truth. This is what you do as a youngster. You start to imitate. I put the bus pass in my mouth and I'm looking at him and I'm going, yo, yo, with my shirt open, my pajama shirt. I'm big pin pin. My mum don't know I'm in my room, I'm in my room doing these things. I'm idolizing. I've created, this man is my role model. I want to be like him. How did he get there? How does he make that money? Well, I listened to other songs of him and he said, I had to hustle my back to the wall, ashy knuckles, pockets filled with a lot of lead. He said, I had to hustle to make it here. I'm going to have to do the same. I need to hustle too. I need to make some money. I can't be wearing Arribas. I need to make some money. So we hit the streets. 14 years old. These are our role models. Everyone in the area that's making money, driving the BMW convertibles, driving the Mercedes compressor, all of these guys coming through, jumping out, walking, looking cool, new trainers. What do they do? How do you make that money? They're all indulging in criminal activities. Because in the state, you know how the government is, they, just put, they don't put the lawyers, the doctors <laughs> with the poor people. They all live in one area. I don't ever meet them. I don't ever see them. So they can never be my role model. So I'm looking at these people. And they're becoming my role models. And if we ain't got the right figures in the household, I ain't got a father figure in my house to set me straight. I ain't got good uncles that I can look up to. So I'm choosing my own role models. And it's these guys. And this is what happens with us as youngsters. We pick our role models. We pick who we look up to. And the ones we look up to is the ones that we look at their life and we like the way their life looks through our lenses. You can't tell a child, this should look up to him. Listen to him. Listen to your school teacher. Listen to this person. A child's going to pick who he wants to listen to and who he wants to look up to himself. And do you know who it's going to be? The one who through his lenses... Looks like he's living a life that he would love to live one day. So if our older generation don't look like that, 
ain't painting that picture of, wow, then the child's not going to choose you as the role model. So I didn't choose my school teacher as a role model to listen to because my school teacher, quite frankly, Mr. Goodright, used to wear ankle swingers and drive a banger. So why am I looking at Mr. Goodright saying, oh, I want to be like you when I'm older, Mr. Goodright? No. I don't want to be like him. My mum's working, but she's only making 800 pounds a month. She goes to work every day. She can't, still can't afford anything. So I'm not inspired by her. She's always sad. She's always broke. I'm inspired by these guys that I see driving the BMW M3. <laughs> I'm inspired by the guy that I see coming around on the R1 motorbike. That's who I want. And I'm seeing what they're doing to make money. So I start doing the same thing as them. I end up on the streets. And I'm doing all these things. And you know what's crazy? While I'm on the streets and I'm risking my life and I'm risking my freedom. I'm praying to God to protect me. Because <laughs> I've always had that connection with God. So I'm doing a crime and I'm saying, God, please help make this crime go ahead in a good way. And don't let me get caught. <laughs> oh, God, please help me get away with this one. But do you know what my intentions, as Imam Bukhari started with, actions are but intentions. My intentions was never bad. I was thinking I just don't want to be poor. I want to have electricity. I want to have these things. So maybe there was one ounce of good in me. But Allah decided to guide me. Because I never wanted to hurt anybody. I never wanted to bring pain to someone. And I never wanted to harm anyone or take from anyone. I just wanted to change my condition. So maybe there was one ounce of good in me where Allah said, I'm going to guide this person. The person who is on the edge of the fire. I'm going to bestow my favor on him and guide him to this religion. Because he always remembers me, I don't know. But in all of that mix up and that stress of the streets, which the more I indulged in it, the more I realized it's creating more problems. And it's bringing me more stress. And I started making money and I started doing things. But I was, the more I was making, the more I needed. Because I had more responsibilities. And I got to an age of 17 where I had a motorbike now. I had a car now. I had this, I had that. But I still had the same stress and the same pain. I still had an emptiness. So I started questioning, what is the real purpose of life? What am I really doing here? And I remember that same rapper that I listened to. I used to listen to him when I'm stressed. This is what we used to do, turn to music. And he had another song where he was saying, this can't be life, this can't be real, there's got to be more. And I think, yeah, it's true, man. This can't be life. This can't be real. There's got to be more. Because I've got money now and I don't feel complete. And then imagine that same role model that drove the convertible BMW and he used to drive the R1 motorbike. Now I've got money, I used to go to the studio. Because as men, the truth is when we're suffering and we're struggling, we don't know how to open up and speak about our problems. We try to be a man and hold it in. You know, the girls were taught to show love and to be affectionate. You see, girls, when they see each other, it's normal. Before Islam, they greet each other with a hug. Hey, how are you? The boys, we used to just be like, yeah, well, go on, bro. And this fist bump. <laughs> we was taught to be tough. I never used to hug my friends. I learned that in Islam. The hug and shake. It was just like, you good. Yeah, you good. <laughs> that was it. So when we're going through problems and hardship, we used to keep it in. We weren't allowed to show. It was soft. So our, my way of my therapy was writing lyrics and rapping. That's when I used to speak about my problems through my lyrics. So I built a studio. And what's crazy is one day I've gone to my studio and all of the man them, the guys used to chill there. There'll be like 10 of us. And when we was in the studio, I just remember this one day, the guy that I built the studio with said, when last did you see my older brother? His older brother's the guy that used to drive the convertible car and the motorbikes. I said, I haven't seen him for ages. He said, do you know he's downstairs? I said, no way. He said, yeah, he's here. I said, I ain't seen him since I was a kid. And he used to look up to him on his estate. And then he comes upstairs. I'm excited. And he knocks on the bedroom door. He comes in. And he says, you guys, turn down the music, please. I was like, okay. He didn't say hello or nothing. And he left. Then he come back. Turn down the music, please. 
I didn't know what he was doing, but now I know what he was doing. He's actually praying downstairs. That's why he wanted us to turn down the music. And one day he comes upstairs and he starts to talk to us, but he didn't mention Islam. He just mentioned faith. He asked us, what's the purpose in life? And we're looking at him like, huh? But I'm sitting there because of what I'm going through and I'm thinking, this is what I need to hear. And he said, just tell me, what's the purpose of your life? What are you living for? And I'm listening and I said, boy, I don't even know. And he says, you lot act like you're men. You lot are outside doing so much. You've got these big characters, but you don't even know what you're living for. How can you not know your purpose in life? He says, you come from a God, a creator. And when you die, you're going to return to that God, that creator. And you're going to be questioned about everything you did while you was here in this life. So your purpose is to live a life that's pleasing to that God, that creator. Because the angels are writing everything down. They're writing everything down right now. What you do in public, what you do in private, what you do in secret, they're writing it down. And a day's going to come when you return to that creator and you're going to have to stand and account for your deeds. So he says, make sure everything you do is something that is pleasing to that God. Because on that day when we're raised up, there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers. The losers are the ones who've done more bad than good. And the winners will be the ones whose good outweighed their bad. I know what side I want to be raised up with on that day. What side do you want to be raised up? So I'm listening to that saying, yo, I need to win. I don't like to lose in nothing. If Man United lose, I'm stressed. I can't lose in life. <laughs> do you know, imagine losing in life. That's losing in life. You went through your whole life, you died, and you found out I'm a loser. And he started saying, this is going to be a judgment day. And we're all in the room and some people are smoking and this. And they're like, yo, this sounds deep, man. Talk to us more about this. He says, judgment day, the fire's going to come. And all those losers, when they're getting sent to that fire, the wardens of the fire are going to say, why are you here? Did someone not warn you about this day? And he said to us in the room, well, I'm warning you lot today. So you can't say you didn't know. And they will say, no, we didn't. We, yes, someone warned us. But if had we listened, we wouldn't have been amongst the dwellers of the flame. So I'm listening to this saying, you know what? I need to prepare myself for that day. And he's saying death's the only guarantee in life. And it comes unexpectedly without a warning. You don't necessarily die when you're 80 years old, 90 years old. You might die at 16, 21, 25, 26 your time of death has been written. And when that angel comes, which visits you every day, one of those times the angels visit you, Allah is going to say, be, and it will be. And that's it. Your time's up. Make sure you're ready on that day and your good outweighs your bad. And I sat there listening to that and I said, you know what? I need to do, I need to start reading the books this guy's reading. I need to be in a place mentally where this guy is because I don't want to be a loser on that day. So I asked him, take me to the bookshop with you. And I done it behind my friend's back. I waited till he was outside the room, because you know, sometimes we might not think it's cool. So I waited till he's outside the room, and I, behind my, I said, listen, take me to the bookshop with you. And I went to a bookshop with him, and I read a couple of books until I was just certain. The man said, when I left the shop, now you take these steps towards Allah, Allah's gonna come running to you. And that's exactly what happened. A religion I knew nothing about, it's like this religion was everywhere after that. Everywhere I turned, it was Islam, Islam, Islam. Until a day came when I went to see him after having a dream that I got killed or got shot. And in the dream, I remember saying to the paramedics, I don't need to go to the hospital. I need to go and take my shahada because I can't die as a loser. Just take me to take, and this is what I'm saying in the dream and I'm panicking, take me to take my shahada. I can't die as a loser. I need to take my shahada first. Once I do that, we can go hospital. And they're saying, don't worry, we'll be at the hospital soon. I said, you can't hear me. I need to take my shahada first. And then I woke up. I'm like, oh, it was just a dream. And then I went to see him to tell him about this. And when I went to see him, he said, let me tell you something. When you was in that dream, you was panicking, you were sweating, you were stressed, you was emotional, you thought it was all real. And then you woke up. Ah, oh, it's just a dream and got on with your life. I said, yes. He said, that's how life is. Right now you're in this life, you're stressed, you're panicking about everything, you're emotional about everything, this argument, that, oh, what should I wear, oh, my argument with my friend, when should I get married, da, 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 this, that, and the other. When you die and you go to the grave and the angel questions you, how long was you in that life? You're going to say a day or part of a day. 
you just look back at this life the same way how the person who wakes up from a dream looks back at the dream. He said, this life is nothing in comparison to what Allah has created. Nothing. If it was worth even a mosquito's wing, he wouldn't have gave the disbelievers a sip of water. It's nothing. Do what you need to do. You are created to worship Allah, complete the test, and be a winner when you die. I said, you know what? I want to take my shahada now. I'm ready. That was it for me. That fear of dying in a bad state was it. And he mentioned in Surah Imran where Allah talks about do not die unless you die in the state of submission. I said, I don't want to die like that. I'm ready to take my shahada now. He took me to a house in New Cross because the masjid wasn't open because it was in between prayer. And he took me to a house in New Cross. I was wearing a grey night tracksuit and there was about eight brothers sitting on the floor. He said, let's eat some food first. They welcomed me. And then they said, repeat after me. And I said those words. Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah. Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And I remember feeling like a brand new man. A brand new person with a new purpose in life. I knew what I was living for. Now it didn't matter if I fulfilled my dreams or if I made it to be famous or if I made it because I now knew the purpose of this life was not to have my fairy tale here and my, fulfill my fantasies here, and to live out my dreams here. It was just to complete the mission. Make sure my good deeds outweigh my bad. Follow every bad deed with a good deed. Do charity. Pray my five daily prayers. Fast in the month of Ramadan. Complete Hajj. And then die in a state of submission. So with that in mind... You don't need to go through any mental health because you know your problem. You know your purpose. And that's what gives you contentment and inner peace. Because now you trust Allah's wisdom and accept all his decisions. So it doesn't matter what you're going through. You're like, alhamdulillah for everything. So I end how I started and I just said, alhamdulillah, it's a pleasure. And alhamdulillah, I'm happy that Allah guided me to this religion. And it's an honor to be able to share a short version of my story with you guys before we do what we're meant to do, which is pray. Huh? Five minutes. Shall I do a poem? But that's what I'm known for really is poetry. So now I do a short poem for you guys on my story. Um, it's the first poem I ever done. I came back from Egypt and the imam in my local masjid in Lewisham, his name is Imam Shakil. He was like, Bilal, Egypt, how was it? I had to take some time out and go there. Because sometimes we have to protect our heart and protect our iman. So I've been a Muslim, but I weren't progressing. And I was still attracted to some bad things. So we have to protect our iman and our hearts. So I said, I need to take myself away from this place. Because it's got the disease of the dunya. And it's contagious. So I went to Egypt where I was away from my friends. Because sometimes your friends that you love, they might be bad for you. And sometimes the people that seem like they're not good for you, are actually, that you hate, are actually good for you. So I went to Egypt. And that's, that was good for me. I lost my ego there. It was all right to catch the bus and wear cheap clothes. And I came back and the Imam Shakil said, Bilal, tell these youngsters about your trip to Egypt. And tell them about your conversion from the streets to Islam. And I said, no. I became a Muslim to come away from the spotlight and the limelight. I just want peace now. And he said, no, but it can benefit these youngsters because they're running towards a life that you're running away from. I said, what do you mean? He said, many of these Muslims, many of these born Muslims, they're born with this religion, but they're not valuing it. So they're running towards a life that you're running away from because they don't know that life. So tell them why you're running away from that life and why you're running towards Islam. It might inspire them. I said, no, still. I said, I don't want to go up on, I don't want to speak in a masjid, Sheikh. I'm not, not, he said, just tell your story. I'm not telling you to teach anyone their faith. Tell your story. So I went up there and then I was like, and he said, you know what? You used to rap. Tell one, in, if you've got a rap poem that you can do it in. And my friend who knew I wrote one in Egypt said, do the one you wrote in Egypt. I'm like, shh. He's like, no, do it. I was like, all right, cool. So I done it, alhamdulillah, for the first time. And that was about my journey. As I said, it's like therapy, talking my story and my journey. 
And that's what I will share with you again today, what I done that day. And that's how this even started for me, going around doing that. It was just a domino effect. It was never a plan. I'm not like a... I, so I don't want to put myself in a category like a Muslim this or that, stage name. I just get asked to tell my story, I'll do it, and that's it. It's no more than that. But this was the story that I told. Bismillah. I was 19 years old, young, lost on the road, living for money, chasing girls and wearing gold. Life was nothing to me, just a come and go, live and die, then the truth comes and you want to cry. So much time's gone by, all those wasted years, for the wrong reasons, I cried those tears. Was caught up a young boy in the ghetto affair, so lost with my cross while the truth was there. I found myself in the other side of this world, all for this religion, all for what Allah revealed. You find Belai in a small flat by myself, Quran in between my knees, books piled up on my shelf. And as I read, memories flash me in my day. Everything looks different, so many things have changed. To Belai now, this world doesn't look the same. All the things I used to like, I can't even like again. All the things I was about, I had to leave behind. Ashley was a little boy, but that was the man I had to find. I always knew there'd come a time when I would cross the line, knew there was a true religion, that religion wasn't mine. And it's amazing when I look at where I am today, this and what I was raised amongst I called is the chosen way. I used to go into a church every Sunday, mum's cooking rice and peas, listening to reggae. Typical bad boy, typical black household. I'm walking with my jeans low, face like I own the road. Before there was no hope, I used to make a lot of dough. But when you asked me what's my purpose in this life, I said, I don't know. A few books, a few months, a lot of reading, a new season. It brings a new way of thinking. I reason with a Muslim. He's speaking, I listen. I smile because of the beauty I found in this religion. This is what was missing. The final piece of the puzzle is starting to make sense now. Before it was all muddled, I was stuck in a jungle, blind like a bat. Now I see quite clear. It's a laugh, thank for that. He brought me the facts, now the boy from the flats is the boy who lay his head down on the mat, it's as simple as that. And now that I found Islam, it shot a lot, I'ma never turn back. See, I was on the outside looking in, a ghetto child lingering, thinking should I take it now, thoughts were just wavering. Will it make my daddy proud, what am I gonna say to him, can I go back to my house, mummy I'm a Muslim. How's she gonna take it down, how are they gonna take it in, will I end up kicked out, will I get a kick in. I don't know what to do, I gotta plan my next move, I wanna take Shahada soon, I really gotta think it through. You see what's right for me, I have to do, I live for me and not for you, I don't believe that is true, the things I see in the news, it's my choice, I'ma choose, I ain't got nothing to lose. This is the religion of truth, read the books, found the proof. Ismail came to me, sat me down and said to me, what's your purpose in life? It just was like a game to me, I would think occasionally, Ismail was right, I need to change up my life tonight, could be my last night. Just before the summer year 2002, my mind's already had a wonder now, it's time to make a move. I made my way down to the stews where I link up with my crew. Sitting on a single chair, running my fingers through my hair, I said, yo, it's your Phil, is your older brother here? Thankfully he says, yeah, it's my always downstairs, he'll be up in a minute, he's having a word with his mother. When he comes up, I told him, I think I want to take my shahada. He looks at me and smiles. I stand up, receive a hug. He said, I see you as a friend no more, I look at you like a bruv. Now I can feel the love, no longer feeling lost. He said, take off your cross, let's take a drive to New Cross. I met my uncle Yasser and his brothers from all over. He said, it's time to leave the ghetto life way over your shoulder. I said, la ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. There's no true God except Allah, Muhammad is his messenger. I ain't going church no more, I'm going Juma. Friday, Stretton Mosque, Mumtaz on the Khutbah. I wanted to get the front row, I had to get there early. He read the prayer in Arabic, I understood it barely. I really got to learn quick, let me get myself a teacher. Then I went to Egypt to learn the language better. Feeling all emotional, I wrote my mum a letter. In Egypt, feeling lonely, wanted to find myself a lover. I tried to get married, I suffered a bit of racism. He said, she could have been with me because my parents were Jamaican. I said, hey, I still pray and I fast in Ramadan. He said, no daughter of mine will be marrying this black man. I said, okay, cool. I'm going to make dua for you. And you know what, brother, just make dua for me too. I'm just happy I'm a Muslim. I came from the streets to Islam. The ghetto, when I see my brother give a palm, embrace with a hug and greet with salam, salamu alaikum. And my mum always tried her best to make sure her son was focused. 
My mum always had a smile no matter how slow our progress. And my mum would always say, that's my son, he's the best. And mum never let me forget this life was just a test. But I was raised in Christianity. I used to go to church. Mum would drop me off to school, then she'd rush off to work. And mum saw her son change when I turned 19. But she still loved me the same when I converted to this dean. She just started asking questions. Son, why you do that? I said, mum, sit with me, watch a DVD of Ahmed D that. And slowly but surely, mum would recognise the truth and appreciate the change that I made since my youth. She knew I was flying away. She wanted to spend the day together. This is our moment. We went to the mosque together. It was enough to make me smile. Look at my mum with her hair cover. And then she broke the news. She wanted to take her shahada. I said, Allahu Akbar. So now I say, mother, when I die, don't cry. Pray for me at my janazah. Why? I believe in a life that goes on beyond the sky. And I'm just trying to get there while I'm here still alive. Alhamdulillah. And that's my time. Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much for having me. Assalamu alaikum.